Thank you, Dr. Lesson, and uh, thanks, Sebastian's great talk on Cinch. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Dave. Uh, I'm from University of Florida, and I'm here to present our paper, Making USB Great Again with USB Filter. I would like to thank our co-authors, uh, Nolan Scaife, Adam Bass, Kevin Butler, and Patrick Trainer. So first, we would like to thank our advisors who provide solid funding to make this solid hat and ask us to wear this hat during the presentation. <laughs> so here is my hat. All right, so what is USB and why USB was great? So USB is short for universal serial bus. With the 20 years of development, it has replaced a lot of old technologies. So for example, uh, at the left corner, no one can find the PS2 ports, which were for keyboard and mouse uh, in the current laptop or desktops. And it also has been evolving from 1.0 to the latest one, 3.1 and Type-C. Um, in USB 3.1, uh, the speed can be up to 10 gigabits per second, which is fast enough to support most external storage devices and even GPU cards. USB is truly ubiquitous. Virtually, everyone can find USB ports on every computer, which includes desktops, servers, routers, switches, right? And essentially, there are tons of different USB devices. So we've got USB shoes, we've got USB fridge. Everyone just loves USB. But what is the problem? So uh, in Oakland this year, uh, there's a paper talking about people just plugging the USB device uh, or the flash drive they found somewhere in, without a sec second consideration. So uh, this makes USB flash drive a perfect way to propagate the malware and even breaking into the air gap. So the, the most famous example is the Stuxnet um, malware, which can be found within the USB flash drive. And this malware is able to destroy the industrial control system of a nuclear plant. And for sure, more recently, we've got bad USB attacks. So basically, bad USB attacks allows users to add a new functionality within the USB firmware. So for example, a USB flash drive can behave like a keyboard and inject malicious script into the host machine. But actually, we've got tons of um, USB penetration tools available in the market for a year. One of the example is USB rubber ducky, which is 39 bucks, I think. Uh, it looks like USB flash drive, but essentially it is a programmable USB keyboard. And for sure, we've got some solutions, right? So one of the solutions is to physically block the USB port. Um, this is really common for security sensitive environment, for example, for governments, uh, national labs, or military, military labs. But before we start to use superglue to destroy our USB port, we probably want to know uh, something deeper about USB. So the way for the USB host machine to recognize the device uh, is called USB enumeration. So when the device is plugged into the host machine, um, the, the host machine is going to ask for some information. And the device is responsible for all this information. For example, the manufacturer, the product. As we can see, this device is a Kingston flash drive. And then the device is going to request for some functionality, which can be satisfied by the operating system. And as we can see, this device is requesting a storage device, since it is a flash drive. In bad USB attacks, unfortunately, this device would also request a human interface functionality, which uh, is required uh, for all the keyboard or any other uh, input to USB devices. And then if we look into the USB device, we realize a USB device can have multiple interfaces. So each interface is a standalone functionality. So for example, in a USB headset, we probably have more than three interfaces. One for audio, uh, the other for speaker, and the last one maybe for the volume control. And if we look into the interface, we'll see a bunch of endpoints, which are grouped based on the direction of the USB con communication. So if the communication is from the USB host machine to the device, then it is out. 
otherwise it is in, which means um, the communication is from the device to the host machine. So once we know the device, the interface, the direction of the USB communication, the real communication of the USB uh, happens within the endpoint. Then the question is, what is the basic communication unit within the USB wires? So it turns out it is a USB packet. So for example, every time when you type a key on the keyboard, there will be a USB packet encapsulated within the keystroke and delivered to the host machine. Similarly, um, if we want to read or write a file saved in a USB storage, there will be a bunch of USB packets encapsulating the corresponding data. And in bad USB attacks, the storage is also able to send out the keyboard USB, pad, uh, USB packet. So basically, inspired by NetFilter within the lens kernel, we, we were wondering if it is possible to control the behavior of USB devices by controlling the USB packet. And here we go. Uh, we designed and implemented USB filter. So USB filter is a kernel component working under the host controller. So which means we basically trust the kernel. And it has two other kernel components. Um, the right one is USB filter modules, which means system in or developers can write uh, new features and plug in these kernel modules into USB filter, uh, filter dynamically. And before USB filter is able to filter each USB packet, it would query the root database which, can, which contains all the policies for the packet filtering. And within the use space, uh, we provide a use space tool called USB tables, uh, which is to manage all these policy and rules. Uh, one cool feature of USB filter, as one can see, it is able to correlate a USB packet within the kernel with the IO operations of certain applications in the use space. So to, uh, to achieve this goal, we instrumented um, a bunch of general USB devices drivers to trace back the PID of the originating applications for a certain USB packet. So for example, we did some hacking within the USB driver to recover the PID. Um, but before we uh, design and implemented USB filters, we set up some goals to make sure it is not just a firewall within the Linux kernel. So the first goal um, is complete mediation, which means we're able to mediate all the USB packets within the host machine. The second goal is tamper-proof. That means no use space program can bypass or disable USB filter without root permission. The third one is verifiability. While we're not, able, uh, we're not able to formally verify the kernel implementation, but instead we're focusing on the rule consistency verify, verifiability. That means before each rule is added into the kernel, we want, to we want to make sure there's no conflict between this new rule and all other existing rules within the kernel. So basically, these three goals are the properties of a uh, reference monitor. And then the, last, uh, the fourth goal is granularity. So in general, we want to provide as many rule constructions as possible to enable system in to write powerful and uh, flexible rules. The last one is extensibility. Um, just like the USB filter module we mentioned before, uh, we allow system in to write new features and plug in them into USB filter. So first, let's look at rule constructions. So basically, we've ha we have 21 rule constructions, and we divided them uh, into four tables. The first table is the process table, which has all the information about this uh, user space process application. For example, we've got PID, PPID, UID, and a command line. And then the second table is device table, which has all the information about this device like manufacturer, product, serial number, and some physical connecting information about this device. For example, where this device is plugged into, the bus number, the port number. And then the third table is packet table. It has the properties about this USB packet. 
for example, if this is a keyboard packet or if this is a USB storage packet, uh, what about the direction? Is this in or out? And what is the endpoint which is responsible for the communication? And the last table is LUM, which is short for Linux USB filter module, and we'll, we'll talk about that in later uh, slides. So before we can talk about root consistency, we need to talk about uh, something else. Because the way we look for root consistent verify, uh, verification is to look for the conflict between any two rules. So um, we need to define a general conflict at first. Here is the formal description. So what it says is uh, if rule A is a subset of rule B, or put it in another way, if there is a USB packet which matches both the rule A and rule B, we will say there will be some general conflict between rule A and rule B. So for example, uh, if we have a rule saying that blocking all USB ports, and then we have another rule saying that blocking USB port five, then there will be general conflict. And depends on the, uh, the final action of these rules, which is either allow this packet or to drop this packet, we have weak conflict and a strong conflict. So if uh, the action is the same, then we call it a weak conflict. Otherwise, it is a strong conflict. The reason why we talk about all, all these uh, different conflict definitions is our current implementation is looking for general conflict, which provides um, the strongest consistency checking. But in reality, we probably can just look for strong conflict and allow weak conflict. So the whole rule consistent checking is implemented as a prolog engine, which turns uh, the, the rule policy checking into logic reasoning. And then here is the Linux USB filter module. It is essentially a user-defined extension for USB filter. So to write a LUM, all we need is to include this header file, and then one can write a cool kernel module. So it is a rule construction unit, which means once the LUM is plugged into the USB filter, one can write new rules using this LUM, as we have seen in the rule construction table. And essentially, LUM is a way to look into the USB packet, may encapsulate uh, other packets like SCSI command, IP packet, or um, human interface device packets, like the uh, keystroke from keyboard. So here we show a simple LUM implementation to detect the SCSI write command. So SCSI is the protocol used by most USB storage devices. So to read or write a file within a USB storage, the USB packet is able or needs to carry the corresponding SCSI command and the data inside to finish the real job. The core implementation of this LUM is only 28 lines, including space and comments. So the first thing is we look at uh, the direction of the packet. We want to make sure this is a packet from the host machine to the device. Then we want to make sure this packet is large enough because we want to know it has to contain some SCUS, some SCUS command inside. And then we want to make sure um, this packet has something rather than just a USB packet header. And then we extract the opcode of this SCSI command from this USB packet. Uh, we look at this opcode. If this is a SCSI write command, we return one. Otherwise, we return zero. So in general, uh, uh, the USB filter uh, has changed 27 kernel source files, including four new files and 23 modified files. All the changes are across USB, SCSI, block, networking subsystems. Uh, we also design and implement a use space tool called USB tables, which has an internal prolog engine to do rule consistency checking and we provided 20 rule constructions, which covers almost all the useful information uh, which can be provided by the kernel. So the first case is here uh, to show how we can stop bad USB attacks using a uh, USB filter. So one common bad USB attacks is to allow 
non-input uh, devices to type like keyboard or to move like mouse. So the first rule we need is basically to allow our own mouse to move like a mouse. Then we've got a second rule. That means we allow our own keyboard to type. Then the last one is saying that we will drop all other uh, keyboard or mouse packet for any other devices. The second case is to show how we can pin certain applications to certain USB device. Now, the first rule is saying that we allow application Skype to access the web camera with this serial number is B44 blah blah. And the second rule is, is saying we're gonna drop all other packets for this device. So this case is really useful because we prevent any other malicious programs in the user space to, uh, from accessing the, the USB web camera. And to stop that exfiltration from the host machine, all we need is essentially one simple rule. So within this rule, uh, we are using the LAM we, we introduced before, which is able to detect the SCSI command within the USB packet. So all we need is this simple rule, uh, then we can drop all the USB packets which contains the SCSI command, and we're able to make sure no data can be written into any external USB storage devices. And in this case, we show how we can use USB, USB filter to disable certain functionalities within the USB device. So here we show how we can disable the microphone functionality within a USB headset. Um, this case is really useful because in security sensitive environments, um, the, speak, uh, the microphone functionality is forbidden. So with the help of this rule, users can bring their uh, own USB headsets uh, and using them without worrying about breaking the security, uh, the security requirement. And then here, uh, we've got something much more interesting. So as we know, like, um, the cell phone can be malicious. So we want to make sure the cell phone can only uh, be charged when they are plugged into our machine. So here we show uh, an example for the Nexus 4. So what this rule says is, if this is a Nexus 4 cell phone, we would drop any other USB packet, which makes uh, a perfect charger for Nexus 4. For sure, the uh, Nexus 4 can lie about its identity. So thanks to bad USB attacks, the Nexus 4 can claim itself as an iPhone, which makes this rule useless. And then we've got another rule here. So what this rule says is, no matter what kind of device you are, as long as you plug into that bus number with that pod number, we will get rid of all the USB traffic. So that makes uh, that port a perfect charger port. So basically, we are safe to charge the cell phone. Well, to, to understand the performance um, overhead introduced by USB filter, we conduct a series of um, evaluation using a Dell machine with a uh, Intel quad core 3.2 gigahertz CPU and eight gigabytes memory and an Intel USB 2.0 uh, host controller uh, running Ubuntu 14.04 LTS with kernel version 3.13. So uh, first, we measure the scalability of USB tables since it uses a prolog engine to, to do the rule consistency checking. So uh, before we add a new rule into the kernel, we measure um, the overhead uh, of this action when there are 20 base rules uh, and 100 base rules. So uh, it turns out the result is almost the same. The overhead is 5.9 uh, millisecond. This is the result of uh, compiling prolog into the assembly code directly. And accordingly, we measure the overhead of packet filtering for USB filter when there are 20 base rules and 100 base rules in the kernel. As one can see, um, the overhead of USB filter to do filtering um, is linear to the increasing of the number of rules. 
And when there are 20 base rules in the kernel uh, to filter each USB packet, we probably need 2.6 microsecond. Well, based on our experience, 20 base rules is uh, fairly good enough to cover most uh, common USB devices. For example, within these 20 rules, we covered um, key keyboards, mouse, web cameras, Wi-Fi adapters, flash drives, and etc. We then run FileBench um, by operating 20 files with mean file size ranging from one kilo kilobyte to 100 uh, megabytes. So um, as one can see, the throughput of USB is comparable with the throughput of the stock kernel. This table shows the corresponding latency uh, during the file bench, uh, benchmarking. And when the mean file size is less than one megabyte, um, the latency of USB filter is almost negligible compared to uh, the stock kernel. But when the file size increase, we can see some uh, latency as well. This is reasonable since USB filter needs to look into each USB packet and try to match with one of the 20 rules uh, saved in the kernel. And then we give a uh, five times run for real world uh, workload, including creating and installing a key VM from a USB uh, flash drive, uh, running web browser benchmark for Chrome using a USB Wi-Fi adapter, and scanning virus uh, within a USB flash drive using Clam AV, and then we um, double get a Linux kernel 4.4 zip file. As one can see, um, basically the performance of USB filter is comparable with the stock kernel. Um, the ability to correlate the USB packet with the I.O. operations uh, of applications within the use space is vital, but sometimes we just cannot have that information. So one example is the interrupt concept. So for example, when a key is pressed uh, on a keyboard, this corresponding USB packet does, does not have any application to, to be associ associated with since uh, the keystroke happens within the interrupt concept. That means for the keystroke, we probably cannot use process information to write a rule. And similarly, uh, we have instrumented um, a bunch of general USB device drivers to recover the PID information. <laughs> But some, for some USB devices, which requires um, vendor-specific drivers, we need to look into each driver to cover that PID information if we want to leverage uh, the PID within the rules. The current implementation of uh, USB filter is to put itself in the request pass uh, during the filtering, which is the pass, uh, which is the USB communication pass from the USB host machine to the device machine. This works for USB 1.0 and USB 2.0, because basically USB is a master slave protocol. But for USB 3.0, it is possible for USB devices to initiate um, the USB request. So we probably need to consider uh, putting USB filter in the re response paths as well. Um, the, the general overhead of USB filter to uh, filter each USB packet is 2.6 uh, microsecond. It is fast for USB 2.0, but may not be fast enough for USB 3.0. So in the future, we are thinking about leveraging uh, Berkeley packet filter to accelerate uh, the speed of uh, uh, USB filter for packet filtering. And for sure, we need more useful lumps uh, to enable system to write more powerful rules. Regarding the usability issues, um, USB filter is targeting administrators or system means because it is not that easy to write useful USB filter rules since it requires some knowledge about USB in general, but we're ho hoping um, the Linux distribution team may be able to provide some default, default rules, such as SE Linux rules, and uh, which can help users um, to customize these rules based on their own uh, working environments. 
So in this talk, we have seen why USB was great, why it is not great, and then we designed and implemented a USB filter, which is essentially a USB layer firewall within the kernel. We provide the corresponding use space tool, which is called USB tables. Uh, it has a prolog engine, and it is used to manage all the tools uh, from the user space. So with USB filter, we're able to defend against any bad USB attacks. We're able to limit the behaviors of the USB device by only introducing a minimum overhead. So please uh, go to this website, download it, and have a try. And hopefully, with USB filter, we can make USB great again. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we're still running ahead, so please step up to the mic and ask uh, interesting or difficult questions <laughs> to Dave. Otherwise, I'll have to ask shallow questions for, for 10 minutes. Hi, Cynthia Irvin. Um, when you were looking at your rules and uh, doing your verification, uh, did you look at any formal safety properties that you were trying to enforce? Um, since we're not focusing on the implementation side, we just look for the rule consistency checking. So we just want to make sure um, each rule, if you allow me to come back to the rule thing. Right. So we just want to make sure each rule does not have any conflict with um, existing rules before it is added into the kernel. OK. Uh, so. Um then essentially your rule set could potentially leak, correct? Um, sorry, not, I don't get. Well, you, you have a, a situation where you, you're showing that your rules are self-consistent, but not with respect to some security property that you're um, attempting to enforce, correct? All right. Uh, okay, I, one, one thing I wondered about is in your rules, you need to actually name the, um, you, know, you have to provide a lot of information in your, right, um, right. for USB tables. So if you've never used a device before, and it could be dangerous, how are you going to come up with that, some of that information? Well, um, basically, so let's come back to the rules. Yeah. So I think the USB charger rule is, an example here. Mm -hmm. If we were not able to leverage any information or we do not know any information about this device, all we can do is to leverage the physical information about the port, like where the device is plugged into. And then we can write some rules like for any phone. So as long as the device is plugged into this port, we would do something. So basically, by leveraging the physical information of the USB port, we physically partition all the USB ports and do some traffic right. control there. And so the, then there, I assume there's some form of logging. I guess actually you would be able to see, um, look at your K messages and see what the device look like and right, decide right. from there. Okay. We can do that as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm at Wazo Devin again. Uh, nice talk. Thank you. Uh, one question. So in your usability, you mentioned the usability point uh, and targeting system administrators. Right. Uh, I was wondering uh, whether you had any experience doing any study about uh, mapping the physical USB ports to the actual logical bus and uh, port numbers. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is, for example, my laptop has six USB ports and three uh, EHCI controllers. And depending on where I plug my device, it has a unique bus and port number. So I'm wondering if you write a rule which you specify a bus and port number, uh, is the user going to have to plug that you know, particular device on that physical port always? How is that? Have you done some you know, study on making sure that the administrator knows exactly to plug the device there and not anywhere else? Well, this is a great question. Uh, because like, there is no ex explicit mapping between the physical port number and the 
the virtual or the logical port number, right? right? So we need to plug in the device to know, like, okay, this physical port has the port number X. So there is an enumeration sort of phrase right. that you right. We need to know that information. Okay. So how does that? Do you basically plug in right. devices on every right. physical port, and you sort of educate the administrator. Right. Because basically this is one-time effort, right? You okay. can use one trusted device to try all the ports, then you have all the information. Then you know how these physical ports are mapped into the logical port number. Then you can write w it. Wouldn't it be like wonderful that. if USB controllers had a method by which you could actually program it to say, glow a particular number on each of the ports so that it enables people to? That is fantastic. Yeah. But, but yeah, idea. well, that, that's the ideal world. Let's hope for it. Thanks, man. That's a great idea. Uh, if there are no more questions, we've almost caught up, but I have a single one. Uh, I know the Linux kernel is run by project, uh, people with strong opinions, but right. what do you think would happen if you were to offer this to them uh, for upstreaming? Well, um, actually, if we want to upstream this thing, uh, it has at least, well, we have at least to do two things. So first, um, as you can see from this architecture um, figure, we introduce a new Netlink socket, uh, and most kernel developer would object this idea, because just like when everyone wants to introduce a new syscall, people would say no. Um, so we need to find a way to leverage the existing Netlink socket to do the communication. And another thing is uh, I mentioned within um, the future works, um, the current performance is maybe not good for USB 3.0, and we need to um, leverage the BPF to accelerate the performance. Um, similar case happens within the kernel development. Um, for example, the SCUM, uh, secure, com com uh, secure computing, which is a six-hole filter. Uh, it has been proposed like uh, 10 or 20 years ago, but no one cares. Until recently, a Google developer has uh, um, refactored the whole implementation using BPF, and now it is in the kernel and it is a great component for the lens, uh, lens container. Thank you. Thank you. So One more question. I'm back again, just a quick question. Sure. Um, you had mentioned that uh, you know, verifiability as one of your sort of goals. Uh, I was wondering, is your implementation in, in C, I'm assuming? Yes. Uh, you had mentioned you, were, you had touched four new files and touched 23 odd you know, kernels. I was just wondering, do you have any metrics on the actual number of source lines that you have in your implementation and how, you've, how do you think it's sort of conducive towards uh, you know, actual you know, source code level of verification to establish your properties? Uh, like a normal developer, we do not provide useful documentation for the changes. <laughs> Sorry about that, man. Uh, but but I'm, I'm assuming I have access to your GitHub. Right, right. For, right. You can look you. into the kernel Appreciate patch. It. Let's give uh, Dave a big round of applause Thank for you. the talk and also for the...